Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India We move forward with our discussion on the modern impacts that necessitate conservation and in this lecture we will have a look at oil spills and mining. Now before we proceed, it is important to note that disturbances can have different impacts on an ecosystem and the amount of impact or the quantum of impact depends on how large the disturbance is. It also depends on what is the state of the ecosystem when the disturbance came and it also depends on how frequently are we getting these disturbances. So for instance, if there is a normal community and here on the uh, y axis we are representing the state of the community, on the x axis we are representing time. So if there is a normal community, there would be some ups and downs in the community state. So there are some normal variations which are the natural variations that we observe in any community. None of the, uh, none of the uh, biological communities are a static community. There is always some level of dynamism. So some populations would increase, some populations would decrease. There would be some changes in different parameters. But there is a level of natural variation, which is OK. And this curve is showing that. This is the normal level of variation. And then if there is a single large and infrequent disturbance, LID stands for a large infrequent disturbance. So there is this disturbance at this point time t and the state of the community shifts from normal to an altered state. So from this normal curve, it comes down. But then because the community was a normal community, it would have some level of resistance and also some level of resilience. So it, after the uh, this disturbance is gone, the community would try to come back to its normal state and which is what we are seeing here. There is this period of recovery and in this period of recovery, the community is trying to move back to its normal state and after this recovery period, we find that there is uh, this community which is, has come back to the state where it was before the large infrequent disturbance. So in short, if there is a normal community and there is a large infrequent disturbance, the community would shift from a normal state to an altered state and after a time period for recovery, it will come back to normal. Of course, if the large infrequent disturbance is so large that the community has ceased to exist, then that is another matter. But in most of the situations, we observe that after a while, the community does come back. Now, what happens if you have another large infrequent disturbance? So uh, we are seeing a normal community here and then there is this large infrequent disturbance because of it, it has come to an altered state. Now the community is trying to move back towards normalcy, but then you get another large infrequent disturbance. What happens then? So in a number of cases, it is possible that because of multiple disturbances, the community is now no longer able to come back to the normal state. And in that case, the community will remain at this altered state for quite a period of time. And it is also possible that the community never comes back to the normal state. So the moral of the story is that if you have a normal community, it would be able to withstand a single or maybe just a few large infrequent disturbances but if you give it a disturbance again and again and again it is quite possible that the community will change completely so it will become an altered community it will have a very different set of species that are able to live in that area or probably it turns into an area which cannot support any further species but this is what happens when the community is there in a normal state what happens if the community is already disturbed from the beginning? So you have a community which is not normal, it is not altered, but it is somewhere in between. 
and it is continuing like this and then you get a large infrequent disturbance the community shifts to an altered state and now it is no longer able to come back now what can be the reasons for such disturbance to the community well uh, there could be many reasons such as say pollution so there is a community so you, you are talking about a forest for instance and in this forest there is such a huge level of pollution that most of the animals are already sick or let us consider a lake and in this lake if we are dumping industrial effluents or say municipal waste then there is so much level of disturbance that the uh, the lake community or the lake ecosystem is already in a very disturbed state and if you have an ecosystem or a community which is already disturbed you give it any further disturbance and it might not be able to come back to a natural state now in this context what are the large infrequent disturbances some very common large infrequent disturbances are things such as fires such as a forest fire so if you have a forest and you get a forest fire large number of organisms perish but if you have a certain patch of forest that remains then the organisms that remain in that area they will be able to procreate they will increase in their populations the trees that are there they would give off seeds and these seeds would then repopulate the whole of the forest these animals would then repopulate the whole of the forest so in the natural circumstance if you have a single forest fire it's okay the uh, the forest community will be able to come back but then if you have a forest fire again and again and again and especially if if it's not a natural fire a forest fire if it is an anthropogenic forest fire now in our country we know that as much as 95% of the forest fires are of human origin now if that be the situation in a number of areas then it is possible that we are shifting the community from a natural state to an altered state another lid is storm or tsunami now if there is a large storm or if there is a tsunami then also we will observe that quite a number of individuals quite a number of species perish in large storms or tsunamis but if it is only a single incident then probably the community will come back if sufficient number of individuals of the species remain in that area another large infrequent disturbance is an oil spill or things such as climatic extremes in excess of floods in excess of drought so these are all disturbances that are large in nature and at the same time they are infrequent we do not get a drought every year or things such as heavy pollution especially one that is due to mining now in the case of mining a very huge quantum of toxic materials gets dumped and that leads to a very large infrequent disturbance in the form of pollution now remember that when we were talking about multiple disturbances it is not necessary that they should be of the same category so it is possible that the first disturbance was say a forest fire and the second disturbance was say a tsunami so any of these large uh, infrequent disturbances can play a role in bringing uh, the community or the ecosystem to an altered state and if you have multiple of these then the community or the ecosystem will permanently uh, come to an altered state and it will never be able to bounce back so uh, and when we talk about a disturbed community so is that the community did not start from a normal but it started from somewhere between normal and uh, altered then these are the examples of disturbances so a disturbed community could be one that is already diseased so if there is uh, a disease in a community so the individuals are already weak they will not be able to Uh, come back to the resilience or a community that is weed infested especially one that is infested with an uh, invasive alien species such as lantana so if you have a forest that is all covered with lantana then it is already in a state that is somewhat disturbed state because the seeds of different trees they are unable to reach to the ground and even if they reach to the ground they find it difficult to germinate because of allelopathic factors 
and even if they are able to gen- to germinate then they are unable to grow because they are all covered with plantain they are not getting sufficient sunlight now in such a situation if there is a forest fire then we would have a situation where a uh, large number of trees get perished and also uh, because we do not have a sufficient number of uh, seeds that are there uh, buried in the ground because of the lantana then it is possible that the community will permanently come to an altered state or a community that is facing competition from livestock especially for grazing activities or a community that is already suffering from pollutants such as a lake in which we are dumping industrial effluents on municipal waste or a community that is already facing facing climatic changes which is global warming so all these are examples of disturbed communities and disturbed communities are much more susceptible to the disturbances and if you disturb a disturbed community further then it is quite possible that the community will never be able to come back to a normal state now in this lecture we will concentrate on one such large in, in frequent disturbance which is the oil spills oil spill is defined as the release of liquid petroleum hydrocarbon into the environment now as we all know the liquid petroleum hydrocarbon petroleum uh, the word root is oleum is oil and petro is rocks so this is the rock oil essentially uh, petroleum is made from the remains of uh, animals that were buried millions of years back and because of intense heat and pressure inside the earth slowly and steadily they got converted into petroleum so these are mined so uh, we drill holes into the earth and we extract these oils and after refining we get things such as petrol or diesel or kerosene or lpg and so on now if this liquid petroleum which was deep inside the earth if it comes to the surface either naturally or because of some accidents or intentionally but if it comes to the surface and if it gets released into the environment then we say that we have a situation of an oil spill now this oil spill can occur on land or it can, it can occur in water on land uh, a classical example is the kuwaiti oil lakes that were formed during iraq's invasion of kuwait so in this case the oil gets spilled over the land and it forms pools an example of the marine oil spill is the deep water horizon accident of 2010 so in the case of a marine oil spill the oil gets released into the water it may come to the surface it may form an oil slick it may spread to a large area or it is also possible that it uh, that a portion of it gets dissolved or it gets sedimented so uh, according to the location we have terrestrial oil spills and marine oil spills this is how a terrestrial oil spill looks like so this is an oil lake in kuwait and you can see that this large area of earth it is uh, inundated with oil so these are the oil pools that were formed this is the deep water horizon oil spill and we can find that in this uh, marine environment you have a large amount of oil that is there on the surface now on the basis of how it got spilled we have three different categories of oil spills we can have natural oil spills such as the oil seeps in the gulf of mexico now because the oil is found deep inside the earth it is possible that some amount of it gets leaked and this leaking oil will be known as a natural oil spill an accidental oil spill is when nobody wanted to uh, to spill the oil but then just because of an accident got spilled out into the environment such as the deep water horizon accident and we can also have intentional oil spills such as the gulf war oil spill in which case the armies may try uh, in the process of uh, destroying the oil wells uh, they may spill out the oil so it was done intentionally the intention was to destroy the oil wells and the effect was that the oil got spilled now this is an example of a natural oil spill 
so this is the gulf of mexico and we can see that these lines are the oil that is getting uh, spilled out naturally when oil gets spilled quite a large amount of hydrocarbon comes out into the environment so what is a hydrocarbon a hydrocarbon is an organic compound consisting entirely of hydrogen and carbon and they form a major chunk of the petroleum oil so petroleum oil is comprised of a large variety of hydrocarbons which are organic compounds made entirely out of hydrogen and carbon so hydrocarbon hydro is hydrogen and carbon is carbon so these are some common hydrocarbons that we find in oil we find alkanes cycloalkanes and also organic compounds such as benzene toluene naphthalene anthracene and so on so on the basis of the their specific gram are classified into groups 1 to 5 the group 1 comprises of very low specific gravity uh, hydrocarbons such as kerosene now very low specific gravity means that when these oils get released into uh, a water environment say a marine environment or a lake environment then these are going to float on the surface of water group 5 comprises of very high specific gravity oils such as bitumen and here the specific gravity is greater than 1 which means that when they get released into the environment then they are going to sink if they come into a water body they will sink to the bottom and group 2 3 uh, and 4 are there in between so this classification based on specific gravity is useful when discussing the fate of oil and the persistence of the oil spill now hydrocarbons are also classified in one other way which is on the basis of how they are formed so the first classification is petrogenic petro means rock and genesis is genesis is formation so petrogenic means hydrocarbons that are formed out of rocks so they are derived directly from the mineral oils of course we are not saying that there are rocks that get converted into hydrocarbons but then these are the hydrocarbons that are directly derived from petroleum that is the rock oil so these are petrogenic another category is pyrogenic pyro means heat and genesis is formation so these are those hydrocarbons that are formed through heating which is they are derived from incomplete burning of mineral oil the third category is biogenic bio is life and genesis is formation so these are those hydrocarbons whose formation is related to some sort of process or processing in life or in a uh, living organism so these are derived from biological processes that are acting on mineral oils so what are these kinds of processes what is the fate of oil in the marine ecosystem so when oil gets released into the marine ecosystem some part of it especially the one that has low density or low specific gravity that will come to the surface whereas the other portion that is of a greater density that will sink down in the form of sediments so the first thing is that we find uh, some portion floats and the other portion sinks a third portion may even get dissolved in water so there could be certain uh, compounds in the oil that get dissolved in water also we can have some amount of dispersion now in the case of dispersion we can have very small particles that remain suspended in the water so uh, and when you have this layer that has come to the top we can have some amount that gets evaporated especially uh, due to uh, heat so there will be some portion that gets evaporated some other portion may be reacted upon because of air and because of light in a process that is known as photo oxidation and most of the oil will spread so when it spreads it may even uh, get into a beach in which case we say that it has stranded into a beach or it can spread out. there is also the process of emulsification in the process of of emulsification the oil reacts with certain other compounds and becomes emulsified which means that it uh, uh, becomes more and more dispersed in the water then when it is there on the surface and also inside the marine environment it 
can uh, it can interact with living organisms now if there are certain organisms such as say a dolphin that comes to the surface for breathing or a bird that uh, comes to the surface to catch a fish then this oil may result in coating of their bodies some portion may even be eaten or drunk by these animals so there will be these processes of coating and ingestion and finally the uh, the oils that remain in the marine environment some portion of it may get degraded by the living organisms and some other portion may get accumulated into their bodies in the process that is known as bioaccumulation when the oil spray interacts with the organisms it can have several impacts on the ecosystem when the oil gets coated upon the bodies of the organisms it may result in fissile smothering which will reduce the ability of the organism to move to feed and also there will be a loss of thermoregulation which means that the organism will not be able to maintain its own body temperature so it may die out of hypothermia or hypo or hyperthermia also uh, upon coating there will be some amount of hydrocarbons that get absorbed through inhalation of volatile hydrocarbons so they are coming in through the air passage so the animal is breathing these oils and the volatile components are getting into the body of the animal through the air passages and some of these hydrocarbons may result in toxicity to the animal another portion may get absorbed through the skin and through the mucous membranes again there might be some level of toxicity because of this absorption then we had seen that some portion of this oil gets dissolved and the portion that gets dissolved may get absorbed through the skin or it may get absorbed through the food and in both of these cases also there will be some amount of toxicity now there are several factors that influence the quantum of impact that the oil will have on these organisms so there are factors such as seasonality the breeding season so if uh, the oil spill occurs in a breeding season uh, then it is the season where the organisms need more amount of food because they are preparing to uh, produce the next generation so if it happens during the the breeding season then the quantum of impact on the ecosystem will be much greater or if there are eggs or juveniles that are present so if the if the parents uh, to get to the marine environment to catch a fish so suppose there is a bird uh, that has uh, laid eggs and uh, one of the partners goes to the marine environment to catch a fish and its body gets covered with oil once it comes back and once it sits on the egg then it is possible that the egg will also get covered with oil when that happens then because there is a chick that is developing inside the egg it will also get impacted or if there are juveniles because we have seen in a number of cases that uh, very young or very old individuals are much uh, greater impacted by any of these disturbances so if you have juveniles then the oil spill will have a disproportionate negative impact on the species then it also depends on whether uh, uh, the species is playing a key role in the ecosystem so if there is an impact on keystone species such as mangroves then the overall impact of oil spill on the ecosystem will be much greater now what is a keystone species a keystone species is one that has a function in the ecosystem that is disproportionate to its actual numerical abundance so for instance if you consider an ecosystem and there are a, a few mangrove trees in that ecosystem the roots of the mangroves will be providing shelter to n number of species of the marine environment so fishes will be using the roots to lay their eggs so that the eggs are uh, protected from the predators the frogs will be using this area the uh, um, uh, the reptiles will be using this area and the uh, the branches and the leaves of the mangrove are also used as food by a number of organisms uh, the branches are also used by different birds for their perching and roosting behavior now if mangroves get impacted because of the oil then it will result in 
um, an impact on all of these different categories of organisms. So if the species that gets impacted is a keystone species, then the overall impact on the ecosystem will be much greater. Then lifestyle factors also play a role. So animals with a long lifespan and especially those that are, have a key selected reproductive strategy are more impacted. Now, what does that mean? What is key selected? Now, uh, in a number of organisms, we find that, uh, that there are two major sorts of reproduction strategies. The first is known as an R selection or a rate dependent selection. So what happens in the case of an R selected species such as say mosquitoes. So every uh, generation will have a very large number of mosquitoes. The parent mosquitoes will not take care of the offsprings and there will be a large mortality in every generation. But still because so many large number of mosquitoes have been formed they have been introduced. So even if a majority of them die off, the few that remain will lay so many number of eggs that the species will continue. So this is an R selected species. And if because of oil spill, there is an impact on an R selected species, the impact will be much lesser because even if a few individuals remain in this species, the species will continue. On the other hand, there are certain other species that are constant selected or key selected such as say elephants. Now, in the case of an elephant, each litter will only have a single offspring. So uh, in any uh, birth, we'll only find a single calf. Now this single calf requires quite a lot of support from its parents. So the parents will have to provide it with food, the, the parents will have to protect it, the parents will have to train it. And it will spend a very long period of time with its parents. And ultimately, when it becomes mature, it will have sexual maturity at a very late age. And when it also uh, gives rise to its offspring, in every batch, there will be only a single elephant that gets born. Now, this is a case selected species. The case selected species emphasizes on parental care and it, it emphasizes on having less number of offspring. Now, in the marine environment, there will be a number of fishes that are R selected because each generation will be having, say, hundreds of eggs or say thousands of eggs. But then there are also species such as whales or dolphins that are K selected because they only give rise to a single offspring and they do a lot of parental care. Now, if a species is K selected, then the impact of oil spill, uh, oil spill will be much greater because a few individuals that remain after um, being impacted with, uh, from the oil spill, they will not be sufficient to continue the species because they, in any case, will be having just a single offspring. So the lifestyle factors also uh, determine what is the impact of oil spills on the organisms. Another factor is the health and condition of the organisms. If there are organisms that are already stressed because of some disease or if they are migrating, then the impact is much greater. And because of these factors, we uh, connect two terms with the impact. The first is vulnerability. Vulnerability describes the likelihood that a resource will be exposed to oil. And the second term is sensitivity which assumes that the resource is exposed to oil and then describes the relative effect of that exposure. So for instance, a deep water coral, because it is deep inside the water, is not quite vulnerable to a surface oil spill because the surface oil spill comes to the surface and so an organism that lives here is not that much vulnerable because it is not getting exposed. But it is possible that this organism while not very much vulnerable is sensitive so a deep water coral may be sensitive so that if it ever gets exposed to even a small amount of oil the impact will be much greater so you can have some certain species that are vulnerable so the species that come to the surface such as dolphins are much more vulnerable than deep sea species and there are certain species that are sensitive such as the corals and there are certain other species that are 
less sensitive. Also, when uh, we talk about the oil spill, one major impact is toxicity. Toxicity is the potential or capacity of a material to have adverse effects on living organisms. So when we say that oil is toxic, we mean that it has an adverse effect on living organisms. And this toxicity may be acute toxicity or chronic toxicity. Acute toxicity involves harmful effects in an organism through a single or a short-term exposure. Whereas chronic toxicity is the ability of a substance or mixture of substances to have harmful effects over an extended period. Usually upon repeated or continuous exposure, sometimes lasting for the entire life of the exposed organism. Acute means something that acts in a short period of time. So an organism gets exposed to oil and there is an adverse impact right away. Then we will call it an acute toxicity. But if there is an organism that gets exposed to oil, probably in a much lesser concentration. So when we talked about the uh, the portion of the oil that gets dissolved in the water. So what we are talking about is that there is a portion that gets dissolved. Now, there are organisms that are living in the middle or they are living in the bottom. So they are getting exposed to a very small amount of oil that was dissolved in the water. So they are getting an exposure of a very small quantity over a prolonged period of time. Now, this will also result in certain toxicity. And in this case, we will call it a chronic toxicity. And especially when we talk about uh, deep sea uh, organisms such as corals or when we talk about octopus, then the chronic toxicity is much more important than acute toxicity. But when we talk about those organisms that come to the surface, such as dolphins or the birds that come to the, uh, that uh, do fishing and then come to, uh, and then come in to direct contact with the oil, in those cases, acute toxicity is much more important. Then we also define the term exposure. Exposure is the combination of the duration of exposure to the chemical and the concentration of the chemical. Duration and concentration. Now, why is exposure an important term? Well, it is because if, you, if there is an organism that is getting exposed to a very concentrated form of oil, such as an organism that has come to the surface for breathing and it is completely covered with the oil. So then it is receiving the oil in a very concentrated format. It is receiving roughly pure oil. So in that case, the impact will be large. On the other hand, if there is an organism that gets oil in lesser concentration, but it gets oil for a very prolonged period of time. So the concentration is less, but duration is large. Then also we will find that the impact will be much greater. So exposure tries to join both of these things together, the concentration of the toxic substance and the exposure or the time period uh, for which the organism gets exposed to this toxic substance. So a combination of both of these is known as exposure. And when we talk about exposure, we also talk about the exposure routes, which is the way the organism is exposed to the substance which can include ingestion, which is the organism is eating the oil directly or it is getting the oil through its food or absorption through the gills or through contact with skin. And we also define magnitude. The magnitude of a toxic substance depends on the sensitivity of the organism to the chemicals and is also a function of the concentration and the duration that is the exposure. So essentially what we are saying is that if you have an organism that is exposed for a very less uh, to a very less concentration for a very less period of time and is also very less sensitive in that case the magnitude of impact will be less but if the exposure is medium and the sensitivity is high or the exposure is large and the sensitivity is high then the magnitude of impact of oil will be much greater and when the impact is large, then we may even see lethal effect. Lethality means death of the organism. 
so you have an organism that was exposed to a, a substantial period of time at, su at sufficient concentration and the organism is also sensitive then it is possible that the animal will, uh, or the organism will die in which case we will say that the oil is having a lethal impact on that organism but we can also have sub lethal effects which do not result in a death but they result in a, a reduction of biological function or health such as the ability to grow ability to reproduce or the condition of the skin now whenever we find an oil spill the lethal effects are much more pronounced and they are much easier to quantify but the sub lethal effects take a huge uh, quantum of time to manifest themselves and in a number of cases we may not know even after the passage of a few years or a few decades about the complete impacts of oil spills that was there in different categories of organisms which is why it is always prudent to avoid oil spills as far as possible and to manage them as soon as possible now we also uh, define terms such as bioavailability which is the extent to which a chemical is available for uptake into the organism and in the case of oil spills it is closely related to the display of toxicity and the rate of biodegradation so bioavailability is the extent to which the chemical is available for uptake now if the substance is bioavailable which means the oil has been spilled out and so is now available for uptake then we may uh, observe bioaccumulation now in bioaccumulation the organism absorbs the toxic substance through the roots of exposure and it absorbs it into its tissues at a rate which is greater than the rate at which the substance is lost from the body so it means that when whenever the organism is uh, is taking oil through one of its exposure routes the uh, uh, the organism will be processing this oil in its body to remove its deleterious or harmful impacts so there will be some amount of processing that happens in the liver and then it will also be uh, released out through the kidneys now if the rate at which the organism is getting the oil is greater than the rate at which the oil is removed from the body then we will have a net accumulation of oil in the body of the organism and this is known as bioaccumulation and we also observe in a number of cases biomagnification or bioamplification now bioamplification or biomagnification is the increasing concentration of a substance such as a toxic chemical in the tissues of tolerant organisms at successively higher uh, levels in a food chain so what it is saying is that if there is bioaccumulation so say the oil gets stored in the lipid tissues of the body so the organism that is lower in the food chain such as plankton they will have a lesser uh, concentration of oil in their bodies but those organisms that eat these plankton they will be getting uh, the oil that is there uh, stored in the bodies of so many plankton so if we say consider a zoo plankton that is eating up the, the phytoplankton the concentration of oil in the body of zoo plankton will be greater and it will be further greater in the case of a fish that is eating up the zoo plankton and even further in the case of a fish that is eating up these fishes that were eating the the zoo plankton so as we move up and up the food chain the concentration of the toxic chemicals in this case the chemicals from the oil it goes on increasing and we uh, we have demonstrated uh, evidence of biomagnification especially in the case of chemicals such as ddd and you can observe that uh, if the concentration is in water is as low as 0.01 ppm the plankton have 5 ppm the fish have 4 to 300 ppm and the fish eating birds have 1600 to 2500 ppm now the important thing here is that the plankton may not be impacted by such a, a low dose of ddd in their body 5 ppm is a very small dose but at this dose of 1600 to 2500 ppm these birds will start showing symptoms and impacts of ddd in their body so biomagnification results in a greater concentration of the toxic chemical in the bodies which uh, results in a much greater 
impact of the toxic chemical in the bodies of these organisms that are fired up in the food chain. So we can also quantify the impacts on different animals. So the planktons are sensitive it, uh, and the oil smell is in acute, chronic and sublethal effect. However, they recover quickly because they have short duration times. But the seabed life, uh, it gets um, ecologically significant concentrations of dissolved or dispersed oil. So it is not getting exposed to the soil, uh, to the oil directly because it is not there on the surface, but being in the seabed, it is getting dissolved or dispersed oil. But the impact is uh, rarely below 10 meters. The subsea blowouts on the, on the other hand, you know, this here we are talking about the natural oil spill. So the subsea blowouts may have a higher potential for seabed impacts in deep water and sedimented hydrocarbons may also pose a risk to the bottom dwellers. So if you remember, here we said that a portion of the oil gets sedimented and when it gets sedimented, then the impact on the uh, life on the seabed is much greater. Then in the case of fish, we see acute, chronic and sublethal effects. And from the point of view of fisheries industries, we also see a phenomenon that is known as tainting. Now tainting means that these hydrocarbons, even in very low concentrations, can be tasted or smelt in the meat. And when that happens, then people do not eat those fish. And so the industry suffers a lot, especially economically, because the consumers no longer prefer these fishes. In the case of marine mammals that need to surface periodically for air, they get exposed to very high concentrations of oil. There is soiling of fur that impairs insulation and thermoregulation and also water repellents. The cleaning of fur when the animal tries to lick its body uh, to clean it, then it may result in ingestion into the body. Smothering of air leaves may also occur. In the case of marine reptiles that need to surface periodically for air, again there is um, exposure to higher concentrations of oil. Smothering of air leaves may occur and a seasonality of nesting and egg-laying behaviors may increase the magnitude of, of impact. Now here we are talking about marine reptiles such as turtles. So if it is uh, uh, the, the season of turtle laying their eggs, and there is an oil spill, then it will have a very tragic consequence on the turtle populations. In the case of birds, physical oiling of their feathers may cause hypothermia because it uh, results in a loss of thermoregulation. It may also lead to a reduced ability to move because their feathers are soiled, a reduced ability to feed because they have ingested uh, these toxic chemicals. Ingestion may occur through preening. Now, preening again is the behavior of birds in which they are trying to clean their feathers or consumption of contaminated food, especially the fishes. And transfer of oil to eggs or the young ones may reduce the survival of the next generation. In the case of shoreline and coastal habitats, the seaweeds are much better protected from oil impacts due to their mucus coating that resists the oil. But the mangroves, which are keystone species, they can get killed by viscous oil that covers their pneumatophores. Pneumatophores are um, pores, uh, are special uh, adaptations, in which case the roots go against the gravity and come up uh, for air. And if these get blocked, then the plant will not get air. Burrowing crabs may get killed when their burrows are penetrated. And so it is important that we uh, reduce the impacts of oil as soon as possible. Now, in reducing the impacts, the first thing is cleaning. Cleaning is defined as the return to a level of petroleum hydrocarbons that has no detectable impact on the function of the ecosystem. So, in the case of cleaning, what we are doing is that we are reducing the concentration of these oils that have been spilled to such a level that they no longer pose a risk to the ecosystem. And we'll look at the methods of cleaning in a short while. The second thing that we need to ensure is recovery. The recovery of an ecosystem is characterized by re-establishment of a biological community in which plants and animals characteristic of the community are present and are functioning normally. So what we are saying is that in the cleaning operation we will reduce the oil, we will remove the oil, but then 
because the oil already has had certain impacts on the ecosystem we will ensure that the ecosystem is also able to recover back now how do we ensure that it returns back if there are certain species that have become locally extinct we may try to bring them from other areas and repopulate this area or we may try to ensure that there are no further disturbances to this area so recovery operations also play a key role now in cleaning operations the first thing is containing and scooping now in the case of contain and scoop operation we use booms to contain a, uh, a spill and a skimmer to collect the oil from the surface so because uh, a majority of the oil comes to the surface so we can uh, contain this oil by using certain surface structures that are known as booms and once the oil is contained then it can be scooped using the skimmer the second operation is burning in which case the oil is uh, ignited on the site the third is dispersal using chemical dispersants that break the oil into droplets and that this leads to emulsification and facilitates the natural biodegradation and a number of these dispersants are detergents yeah, nothing else but detergents now in the case of a detergent uh, it has a hydrophilic head and a hydrophobic tail and so when there is an oil droplet it will be surrounded by these uh, detergent structures to form a missile now in the case of a missile all these uh, uh, tails are pointing towards the oil droplet and uh, all the heads are outside so this ensures that this oil droplet it remains in the droplet form and it uh, and it is able to disperse off when and because it is small in size so it can be acted upon by a number of organisms especially microorganisms that can easily break it down or in certain cases we just leave it as such because uh, even uh, addition of dispersants or detergents can have a negative impact and if you have a very small amount of oil spill then it is also prudent to just let, uh, let nature act because there are so many organisms that will be acting upon this oil so it can be uh, left as such for nature to take care of it or we may make use of biological agents and fertilizers which means that uh, we can add the microorganisms or we can add nitrogen and phosphorus that promote their growth so if you have more number of microorganisms that are acting on the oil then the oil will get cleaned up faster so this is the idea behind the use of biological agents now similar to an oil spill another major a uh, large uh, infrequent disturbance is mining and mining has several impacts on the ecosystem such as deforestation so this is an area in balaghat district of madhya pradesh in the year 2006 and then when mining occurred this is the result so you can observe that all of these forests this thick forest they are now gone so mining results in deforestation it results in soil erosion because now all of the soil is exposed and so when it rains then the soil will get washed away if there are heavy winds the soil will be removed so it increases soil erosion mining results in the creation of sinkholes because now this area has been mined and in that case it uh, it results in the formation of certain sinks in this area now these sinks can uh, accumulate water in them and they may accelerate the process of uh, of weathering of the uh, calcium uh, rich uh, rocks in that area which will result in the formation of sinkholes it also results in water pollution especially in the case of tailings dam so tailings dam are those areas where the effluents are stored so in the case of this balaghat mine this is a tailings dam so the water that is uh, rich in copper and other uh, toxic elements is stored in this area and if you look at these trees that were there in 2006 in 2018 all of these trees are gone because this is a toxic water nobody is coming here to cut these trees but the, the trees die themselves because the water is toxic so it results in water pollution there is a loss of habitats direct loss because the trees are gone and indirect loss because of pollution now this is an example of oak tree mine which is there in papua new guinea and we can observe this mine through uh, the years using satellite imagery 
Now, this is the mine in 1984. So this is Oak Prairie and we can see that this is a small area. Now, the important thing about this mine is that uh, these people did not have a very good system of waste management. So whatever effluents or whatever uh, noxious chemicals were, uh, uh, were created by the mining operation, they were just dumped into the river. So here we can see that you have this river and we have, we have rivers here as well. So any of the dumpings would be dumped into the river. So this is 1984, this is 1991. So you can observe that this area has grown in size. We are also seeing a small growth in this side. But then the important thing is that because of the polluting action of, of uh, these tailings that were just dumped into the river, we are also observing that the trees around the river are dying off. This is the image in 1995. So you can observe that on both sides of the river, now there is a large portion of trees that have died down and the mine has increased even further. This is 1998. This is 2002. This is 2006. So in all of these cases, we are observing how the, these forests are getting destroyed. So from this 1984, we get to 2006. 1984 and 2006. So what is happening here is that the trees are getting lost. The mining area has increased. So here you can observe that the mine has increased in size, 1984, 2006. Then here as well, the uh, there has been deforestation. So the, uh, this is an example of the impact of the mining operation on the local ecosystem. Now, because oil spills and mining have such a huge impact on the ecosystems, we require strategies to protect the ecosystems. The first strategy is to avoid setting up oil rigs and mines in especially vulnerable spots. Now, in our country, it is uh, mandated that there are certain go areas and there are certain no-go areas. Now, certain no-go areas, especially those that are there around the national parks or wildlife sanctuaries or tiger reserves, in those areas, if somebody wants to have a permission to set up an oil rig or to set up a mining operation, then this permission is frequently denied. Because these areas are especially vulnerable. If there is anything that goes wrong, quite a large number of the species will die. In those areas where uh, permission has been granted for oil rigs or for mining operations. We require better technologies, better technologies to prevent the spills, better technologies to reduce the amount of pollutants that are generated, better technologies to ensure that all the tailings are disposed of properly without polluting the environment. So better technologies are required. We need to develop models to anticipate the spread. So. If there is any oil spill in any area, which direction will it take? If you know the, the direction, then you can concentrate your cleanup operations or uh, recovery operations in those areas. And so we need to have mathematical models that can tell us where to concentrate our resources. Similarly, if there is a, a mine that is being set up, we need to know where we can have situations of, say, landslides, or if the tailings are being put into a, a dam, then where this dam can break, where can accidents occur? So they need to be known. So we need to develop models to anticipate spread. We need to maintain rapid response teams and technologies because accidents can occur at any point of time. So it is always prudent to be better prepared. Utilize studies on long-term impacts and mitigation options. Now, we may not know everything, but there are a lot number of studies in a lot number of countries and most of these studies can be implemented in the local situations as well. So it is always a good idea to make use of these studies and try to improve the degraded habitats. Because if a habitat is already degraded and if you give it one more disturbance, then probably the ecosystem will collapse, the community will collapse. So it is also important to improve the degraded habitats. Now, 
in improving the degraded habitats we have certain options that are available with us the first option is recovery or neglect so in this case we just we say let nature take its own course we may ameliorate the degraded habitat or we may even make it more degraded through such an operation so when we say that we are following uh, the route of reco uh, recovery or uh, recovery through natural means or of neglect what we are saying is that if there is a mine that has been set up and the mine has resulted uh, has resulted in a huge area of earth that has been excavated then we just leave it as such because we say that okay nature will take its own course the trees will come up and in a short while it will be okay now it is possible that the site may uh, may become better by itself with time because the the trees will come and occupy this area but it is also possible that if we do not do anything then because of heavy amount of soil erosion this area will be even further degraded other option that we have is rehabilitation or reclamation which is shifting the degraded habitat towards a greater value though not necessarily the original state so in the case of rehabilitation or reclamation what we are doing is that we are not targeting to bring this degraded state back to the normal state so for instance in the case of a mine uh, the area that has been excavated we will say that okay we are not aiming to bring it back to the natural forest but probably we will bring it to say an artificial plantation so that it is better than leaving the land excavated as it is though it is not as good as bringing it back to the natural state so this is the second option which is known as rehabilitation or reclamation where we convert it into uh, uh, where we shift the the degraded habitat towards a greater value do not necessarily the original state if we aim to bring it to the original state we call it restoration restoration is actively trying to return the habitat to its original state so in the case of restoration we are trying to bring it back to the same natural forest that was cut down for the mining operation another option is enhancement which is improving the value of the habitat so in this case we say that okay we will not do much of the activities but we will at least try to improve the value of this degraded habitat for the wild animals such as construction of water holes for animals another option that we have is replacement which is creating a new habitat in place of the degraded habitat so for instance there was a forest that was mined you have a mine pit so you do earthwork and water filling and convert it into a marshy wetland now this marshy wetland is a very different habitat as compared to the original forest but this is at least a habitat for certain organisms it is better than leaving it as it is so these are the op the improvement options that we have if you have this degraded habitat say because of mining you put uh, it in a state of neglect in which case it may remain degraded it may further degrade or it may improve to some extent the other option is reclamation now if in the case of reclamation we try to uh, change it or we we try to bring it to the original habitat but not to the full way the third option is restoration where we try to bring it back to the original habitat and we may even do an enhancement where we try to enhance its utility even further a replacement in which case we have converted this degraded habitat into a wetland habitat so we are not trying to bring it back to the normal state we are not trying to bring it back to a forest state but we develop a different kind of a habitat so these are the improvement options now in the case of mine restoration there are different methods that we can use or different operations that we can do such as flattening of waste dumps and landfills to prevent erosion so in this case what we are doing is that uh, the waste dumps that are left out so it is easier for water and wind to erode them so we try to level them down so that the amount of erosion is reduced we fill up the dug pits so that uh, uh, the amount of, uh, uh, of leaching of chemicals into uh, the water table is reduced because these are now filled up with the earth or we cover with a layer of clay to prevent access to rain and oxygen 
So in this case, we are covering it with clay so that uh, rainwater is not able to seep into those areas that have these toxic elements. And so we are trying to again stop the amount of or reduce the amount of leaching into the groundwater. Or we can cover the area with a layer of topsoil and perform a plantation operation so that you have trees in this area. Or in the case of tailings dam, because they have uh, a, a huge quantity of water and uh, they also have a huge quantity of uh, these toxic elements. We may try to evaporate the tailings dam to concentrate the waste materials in that area. And once they have been concentrated to an extent, they may be removed from the area. And these days, it is also important to perform the environmental impact assessment whenever we are trying to, uh, to give permission for any such activity. Environmental impact assessment is a process of evaluating the likely environmental impacts of a proposed project or development. So this is done before the permission is granted. So before giving uh, somebody a permission to set up an oil rig or to uh, mine in a, in a particular area, we try to study what could be the likely impacts of this activity on the local environment. Taking into account the interrelated socioeconomic, cultural and human health impacts, both beneficial and adverse. So in the case of environmental impact assessment, we also take into account the related socioeconomic aspects, cultural aspects and health aspects. So we in, try to ensure that all the stakeholders are positively benefited by any of these projects. If they are negatively impacted in a large way, then the permission should probably not be granted. So in this lecture, we had a look at two major uh, large infrequent disturbances, the oil spills and mining. So that's all for today. Thank you for your attention. Jai Hind.